It's March the 6th, 2013. This is 508, a show about Worcester. I'm Michael Benedetti. Today on the show, Brendan Malikin. How are you, sir? Scott Schaefer Duffy. We're here again at St. Francis Center as Catholic Worker, and we're here again to talk about protesting things. This is just a coincidence that the last show was also at the Catholic Worker and also about a Catholic Worker protest. This is not going to be a trend. But both of these are about issues that I think are dear to the heart of this program. 508, which is a weekly news program about Worcester where we try to talk about the issues in a non-condescending uh, way. Let us know if we're wrong. Um, the first issue, of course, was panhandling. This issue, now that they're doing something on, is the issue of guns. Scott, what are you guys going to do? Well, we, uh, uh, we are going this Saturday from uh, noon to one. Mm-hmm. to uh, uh, the entryway to the uh, Walmart Superstore uh, just off uh, uh, McKeon Road and adjacent to 146 in Worcester. Yes. And uh, I have to be honest with you, up until this week, I have never been in that Walmart and uh, certainly mm-hmm. never bought anything from a Walmart. But uh, You never bought anything from any Walmart? Never, no. It's amazing. And okay. uh, uh, anyway, the... Uh, 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 the reason why we're going to Walmart is I was alerted by The Nation magazine uh, some weeks ago that they are the number one gun retailer in the United States. Okay. And I didn't realize that. And uh, by far, they are. And not only are they the number one retailer, in 1,700 of their stores, they sell the uh, uh, Bushmaster AR-15, the assault rifle that was used in Sandy Hook, used in Aurora, uh, and also used in the attack on Congressman Gifford, and uh, also used in uh, Washington, D.C., the uh, trunk sniper incident where no one was killed, but people were wounded. Uh, so, uh, and in all of their stores, they sell the ammunition for the oh. AR-15, even if they don't sell the uh, particular, you know, particular gun. Uh, so uh, we thought this was uh, pretty appalling. They... they present themselves as a very family-friendly, you know, America's store, the number one retailer, that this would be quite a move if Walmart would uh, restrict the sale or stop the sale of assault rifles, high-capacity ammunition, and uh, frankly, even handguns, uh, and restrict, if they sell guns at all, restrict them in rural areas to hunting rifles. Mm -hmm which uh, no one's going to go into a 7-Eleven with a hunting rifle <laughs> mm-hmm. and shoot somebody, or, or if they do, that's pretty unusual. Sure. And uh, uh, so it's not a question of just, you know, banning all guns, sportsmen, whatever, my father was a hunter, and so on. Uh, but uh, so I went down to the Walmart to check out what the Worcester Particular Store has. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, they have a, a very large set of glass cases with, uh, you know, with a lock on them, you know, person has to open them and they're filled with ammunition okay and uh, uh, the interesting thing to me was you had all the different calibers and uh, most of them are nondescript they, they could be uh, packages of nails you know at a regular hardware store but some of them though are a little more jazzy and they actually have pictures of the guns on them and they, clearly they're assault type weapon mm. uh, uh, you know uh, ammunition there but uh, the other interesting factor is half the shelves Half the slots with the prices there and the name of the uh, ammunition are empty. And there is a sign at the top saying uh, something to the effect of, uh, due to the high demand, we are limiting customers to three boxes of ammunition per visit, per day. I mean, they have sold so much that they can't keep it on the shelf. Hmm. I mean, which apparently I've been reading the papers. This is true for the guns as well. It's just gone crazy. Uh, today on the uh, news, they said that uh, Smith & Wesson, which is here in Massachusetts, posted one of its highest incomes in its history. I mean, that you know, it's horrible. On one level, one hand, after something like Sandy Hook, people are talking about, finally, we got to break the back of the NRA, and finally, we got to have reasonable gun control. And on the other hand, people are saying, this is the time for us to just stock up like mad. <laughs> Right. On the on these weapons, and uh, uh, they I asked the clerk. They do not sell guns at the store, okay. although you can order them online to be delivered at that store. But next to the uh, the ammo section, they have an equally large section, and it's filled it's filled with uh, BB guns, pellet guns, paintball guns, 
disc guns, uh, and some of them, you know, metal wood stock, some of them plastic, and assault type guns for kids that sell, uh, that shoot uh, uh, BBs. Mm. The only distinction between them, to look at them in a, in a regular assault weapon, is there is a little bit of orange on the tip, you know, okay. that's apparently required by law that they have to distinguish. But it's, uh, uh, you know, pretty appalling right there. They're not in the toy department. They're right next to the actual ammunition, so the connection is pretty close. So uh, uh, we're going to be going there this Saturday and, uh, and appealing for the, to the broad corporation in general and asking the uh, you know the Worcester store in particular, it's a huge store. This is maybe a fifteen feet of gun supplies. You know, could they do without it? Mm. You know, would the store go under if they didn't sell ammunition in Worcester? <laughs> Brendan Milliken. It'd be nice if they went under just organic. For other reasons. Yes. For you other know, reasons. Um, <laughs> you can feel free to get upset with me for being pedantic, but uh, first, of all, the, you mentioned the Bushmaster being an assault rifle. It's not an assault rifle. It's, it's a assault type rifle. Well, exactly. Yeah. And, and we've got to be clear too that an assault weapon isn't actually a term that even like gun the gun culture recognizes. It's a legal term of art. It was right. created back yeah. in the late '80s right. by the gun control lobby specifically for the purpose of alienating a certain breed of rifles. And, it's not um, the Gabby Giffords was shot with a handgun. It was a Glock 19 handgun, the same handgun that uh, the New York Police Department uh, carries. Um, you know, it's I guess the joke I think is really of all the things that that Walmart could be protested for um, participating in a industry. They said like it bills itself as the all American store. Right. Like I said, they're, they're the largest retailer of firearms in the country, and you know, in a country with 300 million firearms, there clearly is a market for that. Now, in Massachusetts, we're in a rare, rare case because our gun ownership has decreased substantially over the last 15 years or so. We have one of the lowest per capita rates of gun ownership in the country now. But I guess what I would take issue with, and I think you didn't necessarily bring this up, but I think it comes full circle, is most of the conversations that we have about um, when we're together revol revolve around nonviolence issues. And I think the, the ultimately the thing that I have the biggest issue with in terms of gun control is why anyone would want government to own a monopoly on violence. Sure, sure. And I, I think that's where, one of the places where, uh, and, and it starts getting into that awkward place where people start talking about it means revolution and stuff like that. Not at all. Like what I always yeah. have in mind, and I try to make this clear to people, are like, I think of like the 60s, right? I mean, you have like groups like the Deacons for Defense, or you have the Black Panthers that, you know, where some of our more contemporary gun right. control actually originates, where you have people that were actually trying to defend themselves in the face of government. Uh, Black Panther is probably the best example. I mean, they're commonly viewed as being a revolutionary group. Sure. I mean, they're, but quite literally a self-defense group that were trying to stop the systematic execution of young black men in the streets of L.A. Um, and I, I just think it's an awkward place that we've gotten ourselves into where we, uh, harm reduction, nonviolence, I think you would have to be insane not to be able to identify those as ideals for any society to latch onto and strive for, but at the same time, not acknowledge on some level that uh, while we shouldn't be fearful of our government, it has shown itself, not our government, governments in general, uh, authority in general, has shown itself time and time again to be the, the demographic that's least likely to uh, cede power to uh, those who are just rank and file in, in society. And I think it's an interesting place for, you know, where the discussion about guns doesn't necessarily end up, where Assault weapons have been, you know, the talk of, since the mid-90s anyways, have been the focus of gun control. But even the Department of Justice recognizes that it's less than 1% of violent crime is committed with assault weapons. Mm -hmm. Tragically, they tend to be the weapons that are used in mass shootings. Well, but when you lump, and for obvious reasons, but when you lump even all of those together, you take the last decade of mass shootings and lump them together, you're still left with a number, a tragic number, but a number that... A uh, statistician would look at and say that's not that's statistically not different from zero, um, mm -hmm. and I, I guess it's it's you know we, we have clear issues of gun violence in this country, but from my perspective those issues could be better dealt with if we um, you know, I don't know take the 80, 85 billion we spend on the drug war every year and push that money to education and hunger and poverty issues, and I think that we would see greater success with dealing with the six to 7,000 young people who die in uh, gun violence that's typically written off as you know, just street violence, so we don't really care about them. Yeah. Um, and we tend to ignore the outcomes of that demographic. And then, but we focus in on the equally tragic, but I think 
easier mainstream media sell of you know a mass shooting, even though that tends to be incredibly rare. Uh, you look at a city like Chicago, I mean, it, it's got a body count that, that's now beginning to rival our experiences in Iraq. And there's no conversation as to uh, really around that that's a city where you can't own a gun. You, 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 they don't allow gun ownership. I mean, we're still trying to work through the Heller case that where the Supreme Court ruled against the city. Um, and I, it, it, I guess it, a lot of it is philosophical, but at, at the end of the day, what we really seem to be talking about is that the only people that should have that style of weapon are police departments or militaries. And again, I'm not advocating that, you know, we all need to be prepared for and worry about our government or whatnot. But I think philosophically, that's a very, very awkward construct to, to work with. Well, I, I, there's a couple of things that you said there that are, well, they're, they're very interesting and they're on point, but there's a little bit of confusion, I think, uh, about the Catholic worker perspective. The Catholic worker is a personalist uh, uh, community. Mm -hmm. We actually don't ask the government uh, to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask the government oftentimes to stop doing things. Sure because uh, it, it's, it's harmful. Our, our uh, modus operandi is to uh, present information, present ideals, and encourage individuals you know, to act out of their own information and conscience mm -hmm. in ways that can make change. It's a, it's a, it's a grassroots sort of thing. And uh, we're very leery of the idea of, uh, uh, of change from the top mm -hmm. and, of a, and, and a legislative change. And for some of the reasons you said, but other reasons too, uh, prohibition is the best example. You, you, you can't, you know, and uh, to really have social change uh, uh, in, uh, on fundamental issues, there has to be education. People have to be persuaded. Sure. And it has to, it has to, there has to become a culture of, of understanding why we can't smoke mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, in a public place. Yeah. That has to build to the point where you can, people understand it. Right. You know, and, it's unfortunate uh, that they actually have to, it takes work to get that's to right, that point, that's right. but it does. And uh, uh, so vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, guns... This is part of our, uh, of our intention here. The same thing with our, our newspaper article, mm -hmm. which we just ran, which is Gun Facts, which is a uh, little synopsis from many different studies of statistics. And if you're looking at the broad statistics, you're correct that these uh, salt-style weapons have been used in some mass shootings mm -hmm. because uh, even though they're not fully automatic, oftentimes they can be made fully automatic quite easily. And uh, even in semi-automatic with large you know, capacity, sure. uh, they can be used quite a, quite a lot. It's not like mm -hmm. a bolt rifle, you know, the rifle I had when I was a kid, which took yeah. me forever to kill 30 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, But the handgun is really the weapon of choice for, uh, for most killings, and it's the thing that causes most killings in people's homes and so on and whatever. We need to come to an understanding as a society that there is uh, a fallacy of, about violence, that our whole society has the notion that violence is both at one time evil and another time our salvation. Mm -hmm. And either as individuals and as a society through the state, yeah. and giving those types of weapons of increasing uh, ferocity to police and to soldiers is part of that same culture that says that you know the more <clears throat> killing capacity it has, somehow the safer we're going to become. And the logic, uh, I mean, the history is just disproves this. Right. The more weaponry that the, the the FBI and so on has, the more likely, like in this most recent instance where they burned the uh, uh, the, the cabin of the man uh, in uh, uh, in California, mm -hmm. the police officer, that's very similar to Ruby Ridge. Yeah. You know, very, very similar. Waco, it, Texas as well. Waco, I mean, right. Not passing judgment on what the individuals in question were up right. to, but the but they result, used yeah. they used a type of weaponry that mm -hmm. would not have been available to police mm -hmm. in another time. And, uh, right. you know, and, uh, and so the harm... Uh, you know, and you think of the move situation where they dropped a bomb on the building, basically in, in, in Philadelphia. Yeah. But uh, so uh, that's one of the things is that you know we by appealing to Walmart, we're appealing to Walmart, not to the government. Sure. And we're appealing to the shoppers who come in mm -hmm. to think about you know not buying these weapons and about you know the the, the fallacy of these things are going to make you safer. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other uh, uh, the other aspect, which is harder and really will underpin the change is people have to have the understanding of the history of the success in opposing violent regimes nonviolently mm -hmm. and the failure uh, in other cases. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I mean, my wife is working at the Center for Nonviolent Solutions and they're doing a, a study session now in uh, uh, Sullivan Middle, Middle School on uh, what was done in Chile. Mm -hmm. 
where a plebiscite helped you know overturn the uh, you know the dictatorship, mm -hmm. and it's it's not a straight line. It, you know, it's a spotty thing, and some people were beaten and so on. Sure. But it's largely a very successful nonviolent campaign. Mm -hmm. The removal of the dictator in the Philippines, the similar kind of, kind of story, and to contrast it, we only need to look uh, to Syria. Mm -hmm. And in Syria, people went from a nonviolent campaign to a violent campaign, now to an extremely violent campaign. And today, ironically, uh, uh, 20 UN peacekeepers were kidnapped by members of the Syrian opposition to hold them hostage to try to prevent the uh, to to try to prevent the Syrian government from bombing them. Yeah, sure, yeah. So they're looking for nonviolent peace people to be in their presence, you know, to recognize peacekeepers because the recognition is their weapons can't prevent them, protect right. them, mm -hmm. you know, from these airstrikes. What can prevent them is a is a uh, uh, is people being there that the government would not want to kill. Right. Which I which ironically raises the same issue that you could be those people. Mm -hmm. If if you were employing a different uh, a different methodology, I remember it was almost two years ago. We did a show up at the center with Claire, and I and I, I to this day I feel bad for about the show because I always felt like it came off like a debate. But yeah. it was really what I was trying to get across was that you know I think the average person has a very difficult time um, marrying uh, the ideals of nonviolence with basic evolutionary concepts of self preservation. Oh, and, and or and success. I, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think you could look, you could, you could cherry pick almost any, you know, instance throughout human history and say, well, here's a great example where nonviolence works, and you could say, here's a great example of self-preservation works. Uh, both flawed in some regards yeah. by, from a thirty thousand foot view, but to the individual, I think uh, what resonates, especially in this country, maybe it's a flawed ideal that we need to get over because we've got lots of crazy ideas that we need uh -huh. to get over. Is that self-preservation is something that is always personal. Um, and I, you know, there's a lot of great writings out there about how one of the real hallmarks of civilization is being able to turn security over to a larger body, like the state. And that, does, again, sounds like a great idea and a great ideal, except that never really seems to work out so hot yeah. either. Yeah. And, uh, it's, and again, I think the, 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 the problem is this ends up being a political debate, which you've clearly stated is not the interest really from the Catholic worker perspective, well, at least in terms of ultimately it has political everything has political implications, sure. you know. But right. it, it ends up being a political debate that ends up being one of those wedge issues where nothing actually gets done um, or nothing changes. But at the end of the day, we still have this massive body count in this country, which yeah. we could actually do something about. Again, if you look right. at the cities that have massive amounts of gun violence, they also tend to be the areas where there's massive amounts of poverty, uh, massive uh, defunding of education. Uh, massive hunger issues. I mean, you can kind of paint a picture, and in, 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 I think in anyone's mind, where you say, "Well, I can see why someone would would, res would resort to acts of desperation yeah. and violence yeah. just to see the end of the day." Doesn't justify the behavior, but it's almost as a as a culture, we've created this one big problem that we almost refuse to ignore, or uh, we refuse to resolve. Uh, but then we take the easy fix using tragedy to go after inanimate objects that become the symbol of well, those Well, and the other, the other thing, too, in Washington, D.C., once uh, Claire and I were walking down the street at night, and uh, uh, we were at the Catholic Worker then, and I saw a, a toy gun mm -hmm. on the sidewalk. I looked around, there's nobody anywhere in the, uh, you know, in the area. A very realistic-looking little, uh, you know, machine handgun. Mm -hmm. And I just picked it up, snapped it over my knee, and dropped it in a trash barrel mm -hmm. right there. And out of nowhere, a child comes out and says, "You threw, you broke my gun," and and, and I, I had not seen this yeah. child. I, it was just discarded there, and he wanted me to buy him another one. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, you know, I said, well, was, I didn't know it was yours," and I said, "But I don't really want to buy you another one." And he said, "I'm getting my dad." So he got his dad, and his dad comes out, and we have this conversation, and he lifts up his shirt, and he's got a huge scar. He's an African American guy, and he says. This country sent me to Vietnam. He said, they put a gun in my hands and told me to kill people who had never done anything to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in his culture, well, you might want to use violence against somebody that had offended you, but to kill poor total strangers was to him sick. <laughs> and they gave him license for that. Mm -hmm. And he said, they, you know, they created, a, they created the, uh, the gun culture. Mm -hmm. They trained me in the gun culture. And the conversation was really, really interesting with him. It was a good conversation, but it made me aware that, you know, especially now with an all-volunteer military, you know, many of these people uh, of color, but also pe people of poverty, Timothy McVeigh, whatever, they developed their notion 
of sniping and killing and whatever, they are trained in this by the government through yeah. the military. And, uh, you know, the culture of actual killing, not just a, a concept of violence as, you know, some sort of vague sort of thing you get from movies and from mm-hmm. books and whatever, but they have it as an experience. Right. And because of the multiple wars now, we're turning back a lot of these people into our society who, uh, you know, they have a domestic problem or whatever, and the statistics are there. They're more often li- you know, likely to use violence. Yes. Because, you know, so it is a multifaceted and multi-level problem. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it reaches really deep. But when an event takes place like Sandy Hook, it gives us an, a, a moment to be able to delve into the broader issues. Mm-hmm. And you're, I, I like the fact that you're saying that the regulation issue, while for some people that's the only way to address the particular thing, and I think it is a piece of the puzzle, uh, begs some of the other question. That's very true for a lot of other issues. We feel that's extremely true for the abortion issue, for example. People constantly trying to regulate it when individuals are making the decisions. Mm-hmm. And there's very little discussion going on about, well, why are they making those decisions? What are, how can we make it you know, less likely that somebody, actually less likely that we somebody will make that We oftentimes find that the regulations result in outcomes that were worse than the, what the regulations were put in place to solve. Oftentimes. And, and, and my experience increasingly mm-hmm. is that my, my ancestors were very involved in the labor movement and mm-hmm. hard won victories, 40-hour work week, 8-hour work day, really, really hard won. And then I watch business now, you know, employing people 39 hours, mm-hmm. you know, using different uh, tricks to somebody working in the same store, but actually two companies so they can make it, you know, sure. so they can avoid these regulations. Mm-hmm. Their hearts were not persuaded. The regulation doesn't force them. And even sometimes when the regulation is there, it's not, yeah, it's not uh, uh, going to be uh, uh, backed up in such a way as to. So the change, again, it has to come from education, from the, from the root, and it also has to come from the people that are vigilant to constantly push it. Mm-hmm. Because it's not going to just do, a lot of people think we're going to struggle for such and such, it's going to be done, and then we can just relax. Like I think a lot of my uh, older siblings thought, you know, we end the Vietnam War, now we can rest, and we're, we're in the age of Aquarius, and there'll never be another war again. I was like, oh my gosh, the naive day. You know? <laughs> you know, and I know you have to wrap up, but I mean, it, two things that happened today that I think are worth noting as well that tie into this, is, and, and you spoke to one of them in particular, but um, the ACLU just fat filed today, uh, oh, they, they announced today they're going to file a massive uh, stream of Freedom of Information Act requests on police departments, both state and, uh, state and local uh, across the country, looking to see just what kind of military hardware they actually have. Yeah. Because if you look at the, going back to the Clinton administration, Reagan administration actually, but more so during the Clinton administration, and now the Obama administration has doubled up uh, even more so, you've got all this surplus military hardware that's coming out of literal war zones and then going into the hands of local police departments. And it's something that, again, I don't think a lot of people are aware of how many small town police departments actually own tanks, uh, own fully automatic weapons. Um, Do we own a tank in Worcester? We don't have a tank in Worcester. And Governor Patrick in Massachusetts, I think it was 2011, actually uh, put a prohibition in place that uh, prohibited uh, law enforcement in Massachusetts from taking receipt of uh, weapons from the military for just mm-hmm. that reason. The Globe okay. had done an expose, uh, raised some serious concerns. Uh, but the other that was interesting was the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, sent a letter off to the Department of Justice um, today. Uh, articulating that they've found over in 2012 uh, the largest increase of white right-wing um, militia groups uh, growth in that, that that realm that they've seen since the Clinton administration uh, mm-hmm. but more than double what was around during the 90s and according to their research you are seeing a lot of former military that are now getting being swept up not for a, a lack of jobs a lack of opportunity lack of training whatever the case may be the one tool set that remains as you uh, accounted with your story from DC, yeah. uh, is this wonderful tool of or, or skill set uh, that revolves around killing people? Well, um, and you know, I, I do have to go, but I just yeah. the last thing I just want to offer here is that that people continually th- seem to think, and my, my father was somewhat one of these people, that if we have an armed population, you know, that uh, will you know uh, somehow be able to prevent tyranny, and mm-hmm. you know, and uh, the, the population will be better positioned. Uh, when the government uh, decides to be, you know, super oppressive. And uh, the archetypical oppressive government, in my opinion, was the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, very extensive concentration camps, all kinds of different things, you know, terror tactics and so on. But even in the height of the the Nazi regime, the number of people who actually have weapons that are deployed by the government 
are always an infinitesimally small number mm -hmm. vis a vis the general population. Sure. And what actually prevents uh, them being overthrown isn't the population not ha having guns, it's the complicity and the, and the, the fear and the uh, cooperation that the population gives. Mm -hmm. Like, I was astonished when I heard that Auschwitz, that that camp, the vast majority of the, uh, uh, of the workers in the camp were prisoners. Mm -hmm. And that the actual number of German guards was very, very small. Mm -hmm. That they could have taken that camp over with a consensus from the inmates sure. with, with very small loss of life. They could have taken that camp over. They, you know, they, they, you know that this is the, the power that's out there that people don't know they have. And it's mm -hmm. the power to say no to these, to these regimes. No, we will not accept this. We will not, you know. And when it reaches a certain point of people saying no, it just falls apart. Mm -hmm. it, it, it definitely falls apart. And there's also the other thing is the fallacy is in the, in, in the context of the government arming itself now with drones possibly for domestic use and more and more weaponry. I mean... What kind of illusion do people have that even if they have automatic weapons, mm -hmm. that they will stand up to the weaponry that, you know, they will merely provide excuse for what's happening in Syria sure. for the government to say, okay, so-and-so shot an automatic weapon to me from Piedmont Street. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to bomb that neighborhood, <laughs> you know, because this is, the, this is how government responds to uh, uh, civilians sure, using weapons well, and, and, you know, and I, kill I, hundreds and thousands. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and I think our opportunities to express uh, our first, our exercise our First Amendment is well, still there, but only if you're willing to stand in a cage a mile away right. from a, a convention center. Exactly. Uh, the Fourth Amendment is, is there, but not if you live within 100 miles of the U.S. border, uh, where Department of Homeland Security claims uh, you know, the Fourth Amendment is no longer uh, you know, in play. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, right? I mean, we, we, we always thought that was an important one uh, until now we have the NDAA that says that indefinite detention is, is possible. I, I think most people would agree, including, I think, gun owners, that, you know, we've got an incredible collection of, you know, whether they're on paper or we just uh, assume them to be natural rights. We, we did a good job of actually articulating all the important ones. The Second Amendment was probably the least important, but now it seems to be the only one that's actually still standing. Uh, in some regard, and again, that's uh -huh. not an ad, uh, 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 that's not advocating for violence. But I think uh, Bill Maher on one of his shows recently, I uh, did a spectacular job of, of stating. Uh, I'm just going to paraphrase, but you know, with all these rights that have just been chipped away, it would be nice if someone just exercised one of them. Um, just anyone, just come out, get on a street, and just exercise a right. Because I think what you're saying about complicity, that, that ultimately is our biggest failing in the United States, is yeah. that whether we're focused on rights or we're focused on just basic human interactions, we allow ter a terrible things happen because we allow them to, uh, right. and for no other reason. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And we're, right. act we're actually almost out of time, so Perfect. it's very convenient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are going to have, I think the, the other good thing for the people at home is we're not going to talk about pain handling this week. We're not going to talk about any other boring issues this week. I think that in the coming weeks we'll, we will be talking to other people in Worcester who are working on gun issues from other angles. So I think we will keep talking about this in the coming weeks. Brendan, look in, forward to it. We have we probably have about one minute left on the show. Do you have any uh, do you have any statement for the people of Worcester? You haven't talked to the people of Worcester in like a month? I haven't. It's been a long time. No, I, I'm glad you're all still there and I hope you're equally glad that I'm still here. Or not. But Stay strong. Don't give up. <laughs> it's like, like a truck stuck under a bridge. Like a truck stuck under a bridge. That's a new metaphor for Worcester. Worcester keeps on striving. This has been the 508 Show. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.